sweet potato vodka. Need I say any more? Well, welcome back. Brewers, hobbyists, distillers of all types. Uh, I'm George. This is the channel that dares to unlock the mysteries of home distilling. Yes. Um, we are here again today, and now we're going to do a sweet potato vodka. It's that simple and that straightforward. Now, when you walk into your grocery store, and of course, most of the time, in most grocery stores, I don't know that, I, that I've been to anyway, you know, they always start off with flowers. There's really, there's a marketing reason for that, but then you move right into the produce aisle. And when you walk into the produce aisle, I'm not sure what you're thinking about, but of course, you know, visions of salads and starch-based side dishes and all these things come to mind. But me, I see a smorgasbord of fermentable products. And yes, all of them have a different value in our fermenting process and the potential to create something unique from each and every one of them. Uh, and I also do that, but of course, with the potatoes. Uh, now, we've had a lot of write-ins about you know, potatoes, potato vodka, um, you know, how do you make it? Believe it or not, it's relatively simple and straightforward. Now, in order to try to dispel some of the questions up front, um, yes, sweet potato vodka is better than regular potato vodka, in my opinion, okay? And I'm going to explain to you why and show you. Well, George, if that's the case, then why didn't the Russians make sweet potato vodka? Well, by golly, they didn't have sweet potatoes. Okay, that's not a region of the earth that sweet potatoes naturally grow in. Okay, so but yeah, you could use potatoes. Oh my goodness, you, you already know that there's. I'm not going to say there's vir, it's there is a virtual, unending list of things that you can actually convert the starch present into fermentable sugars and then ferment it, and of course then distill it. And then, but some just don't work out as well as others. Okay, sweet potato happens to be one of the good ones. All right, let me share this with you. Now, uh, the, the nutritional value between the two are, are pretty striking, okay? And a lot of people love sweet potatoes, and we're going to explain a little bit more about sweet potatoes, and other people just love the regular potato, and that's quite all right, too. Uh, both of them will work, okay? I like the sweet potato better for the following reasons, okay? Number one, a sweet potato, this is a 100-gram section, and this is a 100-gram section. I just want to compare apples to apples, actually potatoes to potatoes here. Uh, so I got the two pieces, all right? Uh, in a sweet potato, there's about four, oh, almost four and a quarter grams of sugar. There is less than a gram of sugar in a potato, okay? Uh, in a sweet potato, there's about 20 to 22 grams, depending on which chart you look at, of carbohydrates. Um, and then in a Potatoes, about 17. Uh, so what's that tell us? Right up front, uh, carbohydrates, you know. Oh, yeah, the complex things that starch, the, all those things, it, those, those energy-providing things that you try to avoid when you're on a diet, uh, especially the bad ones. But so sweet potatoes are loaded a little bit larger. They have a little bit more of that stuff that we need as opposed to potatoes. Uh, what's what, what is also interesting is that the mineral content and value in a sweet potato outshines the potato uh, by not a whole lot, but by enough to where you don't necessarily need to add any kind of nutrients for your yeast because this thing is packed with all your B vitamins, B1, 2, 3, 5, and 6. Uh, and uh, the, the regular potato is kind of short in that area. The minerals inside a sweet potato are also pretty packed, or packed pretty tight, and it's fairly robust. So the necessity to add additional nutrients uh, into your mash uh, when you're making sweet potato vodka uh, is not there. Uh, you can add more nutrients if you like, but it's not necessary. Now, last but not least, this is probably the most important part. And for those of you who have who have already shut off, see ya. Yep. And of course, the guy in the back who's fallen asleep, please wake up or punch him, wake him up. Um, sweet potatoes have alpha and beta amylase. For those of us who understand that, we know what that means. That's very, very important. 
and a potato does not. Okay? So we already have the resident enzymes in the sweet potato, which will convert the starches to fermentable sugars, which in turn helps us to create our unique elixir. Hmm. So see, that's why, if you ever wondered, what makes a sweet potato sweet? It, it's the alpha and beta amylase that's already in the potato. And there's plenty of it, too. And oh, by the way, keep this in mind. If you're making, if you're going to bake a sweet potato, the slower you bake it, the sweeter it is. Okay? Um, and then the same thing with boiling. If you're going to boil the potato, the slower you boil, it, you don't actually bring it up to a boil. Um, and we'll get to that. But the slower you increase that temperature and allow those enzymes to go into action at the right time, the better off the potato becomes. Now, but at some point, at some point, of course, there is only so much sugars that are available. So you, you're left with one or two options at that point. Yes, you could always add sugar, but I, I don't want to do that on this one. Uh, in this one, we're going to use straight sweet potatoes, and that is it. Uh, I have an option. I could use two-row barley, uh, take advantage of the additional alpha amylase in that, uh, but I won't really need that. Um, and, but the additional sugars that are there, resident in the grain, I could, but I'm not going to. Um, or at the very end, uh, I could just pump up the alcohol by volume by throwing in a couple of pounds of sugar, but I don't want to do that. I want to have a pure sweet potato vodka that is virgin, meaning nothing else has been added to it, okay? And understanding that there are only so many fermentable sugars that I'm able to extract from this if my efficiency is high enough, I anticipate probably about an 8% alcohol by volume, and that's at the high end, okay? That's at the high end. If I can wind up with 1.0 a gravity in my mash of like 1.075 ish in that 7075 ish in that area I'll be extremely happy uh, all that means is that I'll just have to make a few extra gallons of it and run it multiple times that's all that means okay I'm still gonna get some great vodka out of it so I won't be at look at I will not be shooting for my own personal goal which normally would be 1.090 uh, I'm looking more towards 1.07075, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, of course I did. I cut two slices off to show you. Yes, and I put a, a dot of iodine on each one. Obviously. Yeah. You know, iodine reacts instantly with the sugar, with the, ooh, yeah, ooh, with the starches. Uh, and therefore we got these two big black dots. Uh, so that really indicates uh, they are laden with starch. And starch is what we are going to convert to fermentable sugars uh, by way of the use of the alpha and beta amylase uh, inside the sweet potato. Now, it's important at this point, um, before I get to that very, very important point, um, I want to show you these. Notice that all these sweet potatoes, this is probably, uh, this is 15 pounds. I'm going to use, the, for, a five, for about a five to six gallon batch, you need about 25 pounds of, of uh, potatoes. So you need a lot of potatoes, all right? Um, I've got 42 pounds of potatoes, yeah. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make about eight gallon mash. Uh, so that means I'm going to have to run through this. I've only got a pot so large, uh, and some of you may have that same challenge. So I know I've got to go through this. Oh, about three times and this is going to be a long process all day long today uh, so for those of you who don't think that I work I do I work hard for you <laughs> just just trying to get this done the right way there's no right way to do the wrong thing so uh, a sweet potato you'll notice this one has a root growing out of it of course remove all those roots but what's that root tell us well that root tells us that some of that enzymatic action is already taking place inside the sweet potato, but at a much slower pace. Yes, those enzymes have to convert those starches to fermentable sugars to create the energy necessary for it to sprout a root, as opposed to a potato which normally just sprouts a bud and then starts to leaf off. And 
it, th th there's a different process utilized in order to create the energy necessary. So, oh yes, these are already starting just ever so slightly, which means we know they're good. All right. Uh, I will slice these up. I've got a whole bunch of these to slice up before I add them to my pot. Now, I'm going to use, here's, there's two ways, well, really, there's one way, the right way to do this, but there's two stages that I need to go through, okay? I need to go through a, a beta amylase rest, or cook, uh, and then the alpha amylase. And uh, 60 degrees Celsius, which is about 149 degrees at the top end, uh, is the preferred temperature uh, for the most uh, beta amylase activity. All right. Now you're going to use up all that beta uh, amylase, and I'll I'll show you why. Uh, but that's going to happen relatively quick, probably within about 30 to 40 minutes. And then we're going to raise the temperature to about 155 degrees. Boom. That should ring a bell. Okay. Because we've always said that your alpha amylase actually works its best at 155 degrees. Now, what's unique about the amylase in a sweet potato is that it can withstand a little bit more heat than the amylase that you find in a grain or amylase that you purchase from a brew shop. So we can move that temperature up ever so slightly, but I will not go higher than 170 degrees. And the only purpose of doing that is to soften the potato but that's after I hold it there. I've got 40 minutes, and then I've got two hours at 155. And then I'll go to 170, and what I'm trying to do there is I'm trying to break it down a little bit more so that I can mash it. Oh, oh, oh. This, it's a beautiful thing when it all comes together, but again, it's going to take an extremely long time for me to do this today. So please, set aside a whole day, uh, but you'll have a lot of fun doing it. now. Uh, this is going to be, the, the, of course, the colander, and I've got these legs that offset, and that will set inside there. Uh, I will turn that on here shortly, and then uh, once I get all those cut up, of course, I'll come back and show you how I dump the potatoes in the water, because somebody's going to want to know how I do that. Uh, it's relatively simple. You just kind of dump them in there. But before, yeah, now, that took a while, okay? So, heads up, it's going to take you a little while to get these things all cut up. Now, so, but I've cut them up into these small cubes, or, you know... Not cubes as much as just chopped up fine. Um, yes, there's probably there's probably a hundred ways to do that. Okay, uh, I used a knife. Um, it's a lot of work. Okay, so could you use a food processor? Yeah, I mean you could use a whole bunch of different ways to get it. But what you want to try to do is break it down as small as you can, or at least within reason, uh, so that uh, the breaking down process is much more efficient. Now I want to show you this too. Is if you look at this, and you'll see that. And you can tell on, yep, you can tell on, yep. You can tell on this one, you'll see here that around the, I, I didn't skin these. And the reason that you don't skin them is because most of your minerals and vitamins are located in the skin. Uh, and right here underneath the skin, you'll see there's a layer there. And that layer is where the majority of your alpha amylase is located, uh, is in that outside layer. Uh, and then on the inside is where your beta amylase is normally located, is primarily located, okay? That's uh, sort of like the anatomy of a sweet potato, and it's already pretty sweet, uh, slightly anyway. But I've got all of these in here. Now, in this pot, I've got three and a half gallons, close to four gallons of water right now my strike temperature is of 160. Uh, so at 160 degrees I'm going to insert this colander of potatoes in there and I should drop it dramatically uh, and then I'll bring that temperature back up as it settles and what am I going to bring it up to? Yeah 149 and I'm gonna let it sit there for 40 minutes and then we're gonna bring it up to uh, 155 and allow that to sit there for about two hours. Uh, and then, of course, after that, I'll go to 170 because I'm going to try to break it down so that it's nice and mushy and I can mash it all up. So let's do that.
I'll insert that temperature probe back in there and then place the lid on it. And what we will do is we will now begin to track the temperature. My temperature dropped dramatically from 160. It's now 140. It was one now it's 143. So it dropped dramatically. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna allow that to set there. Uh, as all those potatoes soak up all that thermal energy and then but once it balances out I'll know what to do uh, which is turn the heat on and bring it up to 149 and hold it there we'll be back well now for those who have decided for whatever reason that yep I'm done I'm gone I'm out of here we'll see you later I know you'll be back uh, but for those who stuck around here's a little bit of information that will believe it or not lend itself to any and all of your brewing processes Okay, keep this in mind. Hear me ask the question, what are the low hanging, what is the low hanging fruit that your yeast just love to devour? That is glucose. Okay, and it will always eat that glucose, always. The more you give it, the better off you're gonna be, okay? And the happier you're gonna be. These are the other two sugars that we have that are we find normally in most of our saccharides. Remember, saccharide is nothing more than a good technical term for sugars. Um, now these are monosaccharides, means they are, this is a sugar composed of two molecules. This one is a glucose. And this one is a Fructose, and you'll be familiar with that. Fructose is normally those sugars that are in normally fruits, but are in a lot of plants as well. But if you connect a glucose and a fructose together, you get a sucrose. That's about the size of that, okay? Now, a maltose, and you'll notice that this looks just like this, and this is nothing more than a, a handwritten depiction of a molecule, okay? This is a Sugar molecule, a monosaccharide, means one, one molecule. Uh, well, when you put them together, they become a disaccharide, two. So then this one is a glucose, and this one is a glucose. You put two of those together, you get a maltose. Now see, before you think that you're all confused, let's really, really simplify this, okay? Because what are we looking for in the end? All right, we're, we're trying to break down as many glucose molecules by themselves as we possibly can. Uh, within reason, of course. Okay, and now you've heard this before, you know, the there's a 1-4 connection and then there's the 1-6 connection between the carbons. And, let me show you what that really means. In this particular case, two glucose molecules between, yep, and I missed, I've got it, there, there should be another hydrogen right there. Yep, there you go, see I already made a mistake. That's okay, I just happen to know that. Uh, between, between this point and this point is known as the 1-4 chain. That's the connection of the 1-4 chain. Unfortunately, between this point and this point is the 1-2 chain, so amylase doesn't help you there. Sorry, it's just the way it works. Now what does amylase do? Amylase breaks down the 1,4 chain. It cleaves it, cuts it, okay? And that's the alpha amylase. The beta amylase breaks apart the 1,6 chain. Now what is the 1,6 chain? Oh. I'm glad you asked that question because it's relatively simple in itself, okay? Now remember, we've got monosaccharides, okay? We want, uh, we've got disaccharides. We want monosaccharides if at all possible, all right? So we want to break these 1,4 chains by using alpha amylase. Uh, but in order to break those 1,4 chains, you have the polysaccharides, which are multiple, multiple, multiple connections in, of these chains of sugars and when it happens about about every 10 of these 
about every 10 gluco, glucose molecules, you'll have the 1, 6 connection. Okay, and that is, instead of from here to here, the 1, 4 chain, it would go from here to here. Or, if we want to use the same two molecules together, we could say it connects from here to here and then starts another chain all by itself, okay? And so, but we want, to, we want to break those connections because we want to first, we want to get a bunch of these, if at all possible, and then from there, we want to break it down and get a bunch of these. The more of these you have, the more alcohol you can create. See, that's it when it comes to sugars in a nutshell. So additionally, when you have these, it's considered an amylose. <laughs> stay with me, stay with me. When you have them with the one six connection, that additional chain that branches off about every 10 molecules, and it branches off and it branches off, it, it, it just makes this really, really complex chain of molecules then you have amylopectin. It should be all coming to you now. Amylose versus amylase. Amylase breaks those 1-4 chains. Amylopectin versus pectinase. Another enzyme used to help convert starches to fermentable sugars. Alpha and beta amylase, all one big happy picture. I'm telling you, this is a sweet potato on steroids, having a good time creating your sweet potato vodka. Stay with us, and we're going to get through these potatoes. I've got some mashing to do, as in physically mashing uh, to get myself a puree. Uh, remember, I've got about 15 pounds of potatoes, almost four gallons of water. Uh, I've cut all those potatoes up. I've left the skins on them. Uh, I'm going to keep it at 149 for about 40 minutes. I'm at 141. I'm balanced now. Uh, that there's no harm in that. Leave it sit there until you're ready. Uh, and then we're going to bring it to 155. See, we're going to have the beta amylase work, and we're going to have the alpha amylase work. And then we're going to bring it up to about 170, uh, and that's just to break down the fibers, the fibrous portions of that potato so we can mash it really good and get us a puree. Oh, my goodness. And then I've got to do this two more times. So I've got a full day ahead of me. And on the next video, we'll get right into separating, settling, and then checking the hydrometer, and then going through the fermentation process and then we'll do a follow-on video from that where we will actually run this through a still and make some fine delectable sweet potato vodka for those of you who are already subscribed thank you very much if you haven't yet please just subscribe below it costs you absolutely nothing uh, it gives us bragging rights uh, please like the video comment share us with your friends uh, all those things and until next time, yes. Oh, it's going to take me a full day for this, so we'll be back. Happy distilling.